Welcome to the JOS 1701 Finding Your Way with Maps Prelab Material. The aims and learning goals for this module are to introduce students to the general use of topographic maps. After completing this module, students should understand how to use maps to find the location of features on the Earth's surface, be able to navigate around a map and so understand aspects of direction, Students should also understand the different symbols used to depict features on the Earth's surface and in particular the way we use symbols and other information on maps to define and actually outline the topographic features or the landform features of the Earth's surface as well. This is part one of the module and in this part of we'll only cover the basic elements of location and using maps for defining the location of places. So how do we do that? How, would, how do we define the location of a feature here in New South Wales versus the location, say, in the Northern Territory or West Australia? We can, and how do we use that for navigation so we can tell someone how to get from one part of the world to another? Well, most people have heard of the latitude and longitude and using them to locate places on the Earth's surface. So most people have heard of the parallels of latitude and the meridians of longitude. The parallels of latitude, as the name suggests, are a series of concentric circles that are parallel to each other. So the largest circle is at the equator and the circles get smaller as you move north towards the North Pole or south towards the South Pole. So as I said, these are the parallels of latitude. The meridians of longitude are also circles, but they are all the same length and they converge at the North Pole, that's Santa's house, or at the South Pole. And so these are a way of defining uh, locations east or west, whereas these are a way of defining locations on the Earth's surface north or south. These give a distance, these run east-west, but we use them to navigate north-south. These lines run north-south, which means we therefore use them to navigate east or west. Just be aware of the way the lines run, but what we're using them to navigate for. Now, here's an example of how we would do that. Now, when we put latitude and longitude together, this is referred to as the geographic graticule or just the graticule. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means we've got this network of curved lines now. And so we have the, as we said, the lines of latitude, which are the concentric circles, which give us our degrees of arc moving away from the equator towards the North Pole or towards the South Pole. It makes sense to start at the equator, and we call that zero degrees latitude because that's the, the biggest part of the Earth in terms of the largest circumference for lines running east-west around the Earth. So, of course, we can only go as up to 90 degrees north for the North Pole or 90 degrees south for the South Pole. So the latitude is literally giving as a distance north or south from the equator. Now, we also use latitude a lot uh, or refer to particular lines of latitude or what we call the major parallels of latitude as part of our climatic information as well. We just mentioned the equator there, and again, we usually refer to equatorial climates, and we expect that to be the warmest, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, the uh, also quite often the wettest part, one of the wettest parts of the world. Either side of the equator are limited by the tropics, either side are our tropical zones. So up to 23 and a half degrees north, we have the northern tropics, and, and the limit of that is defined by the Tropic of Cancer. And of course, we have the Tropic of Capricorn at 23 and a half degrees south. We also have the, the, the two polar regions, so the Arctic Circle, defining that at 66 and a half degrees north, and the Antarctic Circle at 66 and a half degrees south. And of course, the South Pole, as we said, is the largest distance or the largest um, degree, uh, angle of arc we can get away from the equator at 90 degrees south and of course the largest angle of arc to the north is 90 degrees north as we said at Santa's house at the North Pole. Now this zone in the middle here between the tropics and, and the, the polar regions is what we call our mid-latitude zones and we spoke about that several times in our climatic lectures as well and indeed we've noted for example that in that sort of zone in here the it, uh, important feature of the Earth's circulation are the mid-latitude high pressure belts. And so these are certainly important from the Australian perspective. Now, there's an obvious starting point, therefore, to define latitude in degrees of arc north or south of the equator. So defining this location P on the diagram, we can give that quite clearly. But what about the starting point for longitude? Is there an obvious, what we call prime meridian or an obvious starting point to use there? So here we've got the longitude of 60 degrees of arc to the west of that meridian, but how do we define where that meridian starts? 
Well, it was actually not that long ago that we finally resolved all this. So up until you know, the, the, um, the end of the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, most major countries of the world all had their own prime meridian that they used. France versus England versus Russia and so forth, all would have had their own systems that they used. But at a conference here in 1884, as shown here the, from the, um, uh, the conference um, you know, program, it was resolved to adopt a single prime meridian. It still took another 30 or 40 years after that to get that completely in place, but at least it allowed um, the establishment of a single system of navigation based upon that prime meridian around the world. There's more information on the link here, so follow that link if you need more information on, the, on the, how that meridian was established and, and what that meant for the world. An interesting aside on this is that it is often believed that uh, the rescue ships sent to the, to the Titanic when it sank were actually confused a bit about the, the location of the Titanic when it was sinking because they were from different nations and they all, all used different meridians. So they were effectively sailing to the wrong place because they weren't all basing themselves upon the, the same prime meridian. So what is the prime meridian? So I've said there is some main meridian for longitude. What is it? Well, it's the prime meridian that we adopt and it's shown here on this diagram actually runs outside of London and, and through the Royal Observatory. So the suburb or the little town it runs through is called Greenwich. It's the Greenwich Observatory. It's where the Royal Observatory is and that's what was adopted as the prime meridian. Now, that means that also established time zones of the world because it made sense if that's going to be our navigational system, indeed, that's also our time system as well. And it actually meant also that 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 established the international date line on the opposite, opposite side of the globe to that prime meridian. And indeed, that's one of the reasons Greenwich made sense, because on the other side of the world, it's mostly in the middle of the, middle of the Pacific Ocean. Sure, there's a bit of Siberia, but the international date line cuts around that, and it also cuts around New Zealand and so forth. And indeed, the closest place to the world, uh, to the international date line that sees the start of each new day are the Chatham Islands, just off New Zealand. So we use our time zones as a function of this longitude as well from this top prime meridian. And as it's shown here, for example, if it's 10 p.m. in Australia, it's 12 noon uh, at Greenwich Observatory. So basically it means we need to subtract 10 hours off the Australian time to get the time in Greenwich. Similarly, we'd need to add time on this side to know what the time was elsewhere in the world. And again, some continents like Australia have multiple time zones. Some places, for example, you know, Greenland, it makes sense to really only have, well, most of it's under one time zone in that way. So it is an important feature of the global geography, the time zones now as well. Now, if we're going to use latitude and longitude, it's mostly for typically these broader scale features. Your GPS that you use may well actually refer to latitudes and longitudes, but it gets a little bit clunky and a little bit uh, not so useful if you want to define a specific feature such as your house or you know uh, a, a very precise location. Why is that? Because it's based upon degrees of arc and we break degrees down into degrees, minutes and seconds. So remember there's 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes uh, to a degree and 360 degrees in, in a sphere. So here's UNSW and it's 33 degrees 55 minutes south and 151 degrees 14 minutes east. And so that's saying it's obviously south of the equator and it's east of that prime meridian. We also might show this as a negative value because we normally show the northern hemisphere as, negative, as positive values and the southern hemisphere as negative values. Eastern longitudes are shown as positive, western longitudes are shown as negative. Now, to actually really refine things down, we'd need to not just show the minutes here, but also the seconds of arc. And again, in most modern digital systems, you actually show decimal places rather than degrees, minutes, seconds. But what we find then is we have a problem that you often have to go to about five or six decimal places to really locate something quite accurately. And that gets a little bit clunky. So for most features at a more localized scale, we tend to use a grid uh, as our way of navigating around. And so here's an example that should be familiar with most of you. And that's, this is just a section of the, the Kensington campus grid for UNSW. Now, most grids have typically at this scale, and this looks a lot like the old style street directories that everyone used before we went to using GPSs in our cars and on our phones. 
So it has a simple system of a series of letters and numbers to define the location of certain features um, on the actual uh, the UNSW campus. Let's see how it works by zooming in in a bit more detail. So here's just where the, the grid starts. Now, yes, we know that most grid systems, so most things under normal sort of Cartesian geometry and coordinate geometry, the origin should be down here. But it makes much more sense for the university campus to start the origin up here in the top left hand corner rather than down the bottom left. So what we find is we have a series of letters you can see which define a location here away from that grid and the others a series of numbers. You'll notice there's no letter I because the letter I can get confused with a one and often we leave out the O because that gets confused with zero but in the UNSW grid the O is still in there but the I is a fairly standard one that we don't include. So you can see it goes A, B, C, D, etc. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And it has to include this area on the other side of Anzac Parade because that's part of the UNSW as well. So there's certain features in this grid that actually aren't part of the university, but they have to be included in that way. So let's have a look how we would use the position using a grid. So here we've got, again, a series of, of letters here and a series of numbers. And I've just put the number labels across the bottom rather than across the top. So A, B, C, D, again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The way the grid works is we just line up the features within a particular uh, the, the, the alignment of the letter and number. So for example, if we line up where a feature might be here, which aligns up with the C and the three, then we just give that as the coordinate. In this case, we'd say it's C3. And again, that's how things are often depicted in our street directories and, and many maps that, that show features uh, such as campus plans and so forth. So let's look back at the UNSW example and say, say how do we use this to find buildings or features on the campus? There's lots of labels here that can be pretty hard to say to someone, how do you get from the library, for example, say down to you know, the law building down here? Or where is the biological sciences building where we're holding most of our classes in JOS 1701? Well, as you can see, the building's clearly labeled and there's also, it gives the coordinates from the campus plan on that building. So the building's actually called E26 Biological Sciences South Building. Now you'll notice all the buildings therefore have a label on them in terms of their coordinates from the campus plan. Central lecture block is E19. Uh, so for example, the law building we just mentioned is F8 and so forth. So why do we include that on the building name? Because it's useful if we need to navigate our way around, if there's visitors to campus, but also, of course, emergency services personnel. If they're coming in a fire engine or an ambulance, it's easier to know where they're going if you give in the building number as well as its name. So let's just zoom in again and see how this works on the Biological Sciences South Building. And you can see here I've highlighted the area that is the intersection of the E part of the grid and the 26. And it should be pretty obvious that Part of it here, of course, um, is actually outside that zone. There's a fair bit of the building in E27, and even bits are in F26 and F27 as well. Why did we decide upon E26? Because that ultimately is the front entrance to the building. That's the way you've been coming into your classes. Once the, the refurbishment of the other building attached to it's finished, this will have a large front entrance into the building. And so, again, you're sort of trying to direct people to the most common uh, or the most useful bit of information about using that building. It does get a bit confusing here because the actual delivery docks around the back, but that's another thing altogether. So we're in E26, Biological Sciences South, as shown here on the diagram. Alrighty, so we now know that how we can use a simple grid system to navigate our, our way around a map and actually give some coordinates. So check some review questions out that are on the Moodle website. So have a look at those and then move on to start part two of the module. Okay, thanks for listening. Good luck.